Hi there. My name is Kevin L. Cooney, and I'm a librarian here in the Department of Exploration and Creativity. And I'm here to welcome you to today's LA Made, an Afro-Indigenous History of the United States. Before we begin, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind-the-scenes staff for helping bring the LA Made programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts and video links that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. We'd also like to take this opportunity to pay our respects and acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of the Tongva, Chumash, Fernandino, Tatavium, and Keech tribes that is now occupied by Los Angeles. We recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside in, check out native-land.ca. And it's right, right there is the website. Uh, but now to today's program, an Afro-Indigenous history of the United States. During the black and red power eras, black and indigenous peoples use solidarity as a means of imagining freedom from oppression. And since that time have remained close allies in the fight for justice. Covering the civil rights movement and freedom struggles of the 1960s and 70s, Afro-Indigenous historian Kyle T. Mays explores current debates around the use of Native American imagery and the cul cultural appropriation of Black culture. His talk will explore the history of Black and Indigenous activism and their continued relationships through various forms of popular culture well into the present. Kyle is an assistant professor of African American studies, American Indian studies, and, his and, his and history at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. He is the author of Hip Hop Beats, Indigenous Rhymes, Modernity, and Hip Hop in Indigenous North America, and of course, the book we're going to be talking about today, Afro-Indigenous History of the United States. So let's welcome to our LA Made stage, Kyle T. Mace. Thank you, uh, Kevin, uh, for the invitation, for all the labor that goes into orchestrating these things. I never take them for granted, and thank you to the audience. Um, who's out there virtually, um, and I'm glad to be here, and I'm looking forward to uh, an important, and I hope useful and impactful conversation. Cool, yeah, we're really looking forward to it. It's gonna be a great talk. Uh, Kai will be joined today by Amber Starks, an Afro-Indigenous advocate, educator, cultural critic, decolonial theorist, budding abolitionist, as well as friend of Kyle's. Let's welcome, to, let's welcome Amber to our LA Made stage. Hello, y'all. I'm so glad to be here. Um, Kevin, thank you for the invite. Kyle, thank you for <laughs> considering me as the person to be on this or in conversation with. I'm really looking forward to learning more from you like I always do and just being in conversation with everyone else. So let's yeah. do this. And before we start, we just want to remind her to our audience to email the EC department at lapl.org for a chance to win a free copy of Kyle's book. Uh, so Go ahead and email us and uh, we'll get those out to you. So thanks to you both. We're gonna start off with the brief PowerPoint presentation by Kyle and follow it up with a conversation be between Kyle and Amber afterwards. So uh, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. So um, often uh, I talk historically, but I wanna talk a, a lot more today about the contemporary relations. I will mention a brief history, um, going to talk for like 20, 25 minutes, and then uh, Amber and I will be engaged in conversation. But I think it's important to uh, talk about our contemporary moment. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so there's a, a few questions that I think are important for us uh, going forward and in this contemporary moment. First, Here's a quote by Franz Fanon, a decolonial theorist and the author of The Russia of the Earth. And he says here, what is the relationship between the struggle, the political or armed conflict and culture? During the conflict, is culture put on hold? Is the national struggle a cultural manifestation? In other words, is the liberation struggle a cultural phenomenon? And so for me, there's just a few key questions. So first, what is indigenous popular culture? 
what is the relationship between black and indigenous peoples and popular cultures? What does all this have to do with sovereignty? Uh, and a question that's not up on there, but something that uh, Amber and I share is what kind of world do we want to live in in the aftermath of settler colonialism and white supremacy? Right. If we all agree that those things are a detriment to black and indigenous peoples, then what kind of world and what strategies do we want to utilize to get to that particular point? Next slide, please. So historically, uh, there are many issues uh, in connection between Afro uh, Americans, black people, indigenous peoples. Uh, one of the many things that I hear, I remember being uh, in the uh, British Museum, and there was a black man in, uh, in the audience, and he said, I was talking about black and indigenous solidarity, and he said that the, well, the Indians enslaved us too. How can we be in good solidarity with them? Right? So that's a, a misconception that I try to deal with in an Afro indigenous history of the United States. It was five tribes that uh, enslaved people of African descent, and Amber can certainly talk about that much better than I. And that, does, that doesn't dominate, of course, the entirety of Black and Indigenous relationships or even uh, forms of co-resistance such as the Black Power Movement. Uh, however, we continue to think of these movements as being very separate. So for instance, their historical conditions. And of course these are you know, different. The dispossession of Native peoples, the enslavement of people of African descent, what is the relationship with the nation state? So native peoples are uh, often referred to according to the federal government, domestic dependent nations, based on a Supreme Court case, the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, and uh, decided in 1829. And Chief Justice Taney used this particular phrase of domestic de dependent nations. Um, native peoples have a so the goal of something like settler colonialism, which is a, a term used to describe a particular form of colonization where an outside uh, or foreign uh, people come to a particular territory to take over, to replace, uh, commit forms of genocide and to occupy the land. But importantly to that, which is what I'm gonna discuss today, are the narratives of colonialism used to tell people that native peoples that we no longer exist, that we exist only in the past. And that to me, and think about this, uh, if you're a non-indigenous person, what do you know or not know about native peoples? What, wherever you're at, wherever you live, what do you know or not know about the particular indigenous peoples of that area? And if you don't know, it's not a, it's not your fault necessarily for not learning something. It's a complete product of uh, the processes of settler colonialism. And treaties. So the key unique thing that native peoples have from different uh, other peoples who are oppressed in the US is their treaty relationship with the United States. And as a brief uh, bit of information, the United States has violated every single treaty they've made with native peoples. Uh, and real quickly for Black Americans, what does their historical condition produce? That of enslavement, ongoing forms of whether it's Jim, of uh, racism, whether it's Jim Crow segregation, various forms of exploitation. There was a whole uh, issue of civil rights and also discourses and the use of human rights, which have been essential to the African American struggle. However, there are many commonalities. Uh, that are that are certainly important in understanding these particular histories. Next slide, please. So um, I want to I want to talk today though about what I'm calling Indian popular culture. So the term Indian um, is not often used, as in I N D I A N, uh, except within Native communities often, or at least within older generation. Many of uh, millennial Generation Z will use indigenous, use our particular tribal nation. But on social media, where this derives from, Indian is often a shorthand for indigenous. Um, and and it, it's a shorthand way of talking about our relationship and popular culture. So what is indigenous popular culture or Indian popular culture here? 
it's a representation of indigenous people's current reality and futures. It's a form of cultural sovereignty. Often artists, cultural workers, they draw on the past um, in order to talk about the present, but also project the future. Uh, that indigenous peoples have a right to the future and belong in the future. Um, it's it's not always bound by the what I consider an obsessive conversation on appropriation, right? Cultural appropriation does happen, and it's about power and how people commodify certain things. But a lot of Native artists aren't always solely focused on that issue. They're ish, they're fascinated with talking about themselves. Uh, and as I like to point, not all Indian popular culture is good, right? And it's not always hating. I think there's certainly room for critique within um, indigenous popular cultures going forward. And I think that only betters uh, various forms of expressive culture uh, for the better of our communities and as well as non-indigenous peoples who want to enjoy these forms of expressive popular culture. Next slide, please. And so I, I'm using, I think it's important to define these. So what is black popular culture? So Stuart Hall, a uh, foundational person within cultural studies uh, out, of, out of Britain, but he's Jam via Jamaica. And he says, black popular culture forms and activities which have their roots in the social material condition of particular classes. And it's one of the sites where the struggle for and against a culture of the powerful is engaged. It is the arena of consent and resistance. Next slide. So, uh, for instance, the if you have not seen the fantastic show of Reservation Dogs, I highly recommend that you check it out. And for me, it does a few things. It represents the epitome of indigenous modernity. And that's just a fancy way of saying indigenous people exist in the present and will exist in the future. Um, and there's many fantastic moments uh, during the show. And uh, I won't show this particular video, but do check out Sin Jody's uh, video, Greasy Fry Bread, because it opens up a whole conversation around something like cultural appropriation. Like, is, is it cultural appropriation? What does that look like? Can native people produce rap music? And just to be clear, yes, native people can produce rap music. Um, and I think it's an important conversation uh, to have in order to bridge solidarity and better relations between uh, black people and native people uh, for our collective futures. Next slide, please. Now, this particular uh, one was uh, from 2017 on Paper Magazine, and uh, Nicki Minaj posted this on her Instagram, right? And it caused a lot of firestorm, and rightfully so, amongst uh, Native people, especially Native femmes, Native queer folks, et cetera. And it was uh, Pocahontas, but she initially had the caption of Pocahontas. And you can see how easily uh, this is very problematic in so many ways, right? And so what happens here is when you have Native women who suffer various forms of sexual assault, et cetera, two and a half times more uh, than white women, then when you sexualize Native women, it contributes to these sort of uh, narratives, right, that they can be taken advantage of. Um, and certainly this sort of discourse is unwarranted and unnecessary. But you can see how even Black people and a Black celebrity here can contribute to the erasure, sexualization, and sort of discursive violence against Native women uh, in particular. And also, it's just an inappropriate thing for understanding the history of someone like uh, Pocahontas. Next slide, please. But uh, as the late Bell Hooks, um, the important Black feminist, has reminded us that bombarded with images representing Black female bodies is expendable. Black women have either passively absorbed this thinking or vehemently resisted it. 
Popular culture provides countless examples of black female appropriation and exploitation of negative stereotypes to either assert control over the representation or at least reap the benefits of it, right? And so Nicki Minaj is someone who has benefited from hypersexualization. And of course, you know, women should be allowed to do that in whatever manner they want. But that can become a problem when you turn that into a particular form of commodity uh, at the detriment, especially of Native women and Native people in general. Next slide, please. And so music here is very important to Black and Native struggles. And I think uh, it's, it's essential. So one of my colleagues, Shauna Redmond, said, music functions as a method of rebellion, revolution, and feature visions that disrupt and challenge and manufacture differences used to dismiss, detain, and destroy communities. So just think about when you're having a bad day, you might put out some Aretha Franklin or whatever type of music just to get your spirit up, right? And I think that is essential uh, for ourselves, for liberation, and of course, solidarity. And as a form, and indigenous hip hop certainly plays a role. So as um, Michelle Rahea says here, the importance of sovereignty as it is expressed intellectually, politically, socially, and individually and cultural forms, diverse as dance, film, theater, a plastic arts literature, and even hip hop and graffiti. All right, so sovereignty is certainly about native political rights, but also about cultural expression of self, of community, of nation. It's very useful and important for our communities to have uh, sovereignty in the form of cultural expression. Next slide, please. So, how does indigenous hip hop add to that future? So I think there's a freedom that hip hop culture can provide here. Uh, and if you've ever seen uh, the documentary on Netflix uh, by Nina Simone, and she says, someone asked her, what is freedom to her? She says, freedom is no fear. Now imagine that. And I think when you see a hip hop artist in their element or any sort of artist, jazz, R&B, what have you, when they're sort of in their element and they reach a sort of higher consciousness of self, that is just like one particular uh, moment of freedom, right? But indigenous hip hop in particular can serve as a way for us to imagine a world free of colonialism, give us the words and the knowledge uh, to better under, understand ourselves and to critique society in very particular ways and, um, and I encourage you to go and watch many of the videos. So one particular group that does this is Savage Family, uh, which I think are on the cutting edge of critiquing U.S. colonialism and thinking about uh, Afro-Indigenous solidarity. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, I'm going to end in the next few slides. So the notion of representation. Um, and I hope we can talk about this today. So there's often this idea that you get more representation, therefore it can lead to forms of liberation. I remember this discourse when uh, President Obama was elected. There's a whole notion of what it means for young Black youth. But then we ignored the material conditions of uh, Black people even during his presidency. And so we have to ask, what is the importance of representation, who benefits from it, and is it ultimately connected to various forms of liberation? And I think that's an important question to ask, right? Do we want more representation on Netflix? And no, there's nothing wrong with representation, right? But sometimes, as Stuart Hall says here, sometimes people take that too literally, that these representations are always supposed to represent us. And it's important for young people for the uh, individual uh, notion of identity. But a qu key question here, what way does, in what ways does representation help us in the struggle for ending oppression, ending colonialism, challenging white supremacy, right? As an individual, certainly it can do so. But in, um, you know, on various platforms, does it do that? It, and I'm not saying it does or it doesn't, but I think that's a real question to ask. Next slide, please. 
Uh, and so indigenous representation is a, it's a challenging thing today. So again, think about what you know or don't know about native people. So Illuminatives have done a fantastic job to report on native representation uh, in the entertainment industry. And uh, many Americans do believe that they, we need more native representations. Right, seventy-two percent believe significant change to school curriculums are needed, and nearly half of Americans say that what they were taught in schools was inaccurate. And as a result, they want more various forms of representation. Um, and there are ways to do so. Next slide, please. So, uh, just a couple of examples of how indigenous representation can turn into a commodity or something to be bought and sold. So the Nike N7 and native representation, and I suppose one of the key figures right now is uh, NBA basketball player Kyrie Irving. Um, and I'm not saying it's not important to have opportunities for artists because artists play a certain, an important role in uh, challenging settler colonialism, but there are limitations. Uh, even something like Nike N7, which is meant to get young people into sports, moving young Native people. But can we also have a conversation about how, you know, Nike shoes are made, uh, how child labor is a part of the production of those particular shoes as something, right? Uh, even something as important mm -hmm. as uh, Sephora Canada, where Native uh, models were used, and there was a lack of Afro-Indigenous representation, right? And this is something like someone like Rihanna has done a great job of getting more makeup for people who like to utilize uh, makeup for different skin colors, which are non-white and non-white skin. And I think those things are certainly important. But again, it teeters a line of, is this just becoming a commodity? Again, something to be bought and sold. And what is that how does that challenge settler colonialism in particular ways? And then, again, it's an important question. Next slide. Uh, and I'm going to end here. And I, I, um, I'll, I like to quote various things from uh, from my sister Struggle Amber here. And I think one thing to really think about in the going towards the aftermath of settler colonialism and white supremacy is understanding the connection between black liberation and indigenous sovereignty, which Amber says beautifully here, that it's grounded the notion that white supremacy, settler colonialism, and racial capital must be interrogated and dismantled. That an authentic sovereign indigenous future is rooted in the fundamental belief that indigenous peoples globally have the inherent right to self-governance, self-determination, and political and social autonomy. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the uh, conversation with Amber and the, the questions and, com and comments from you all. Thank you. Okay, okay. I see you trying to like stick me into the, <laughs> the mix. I appreciate it, you know. Um, like I said, I always learn so much from you, uh, even though I feel like we often have these conversations in private, you know, just in community. Uh, with the two of us, but I feel like every time you present, I'm learning and I'm gleaning and it's really helpful in me understanding like my own politics around, you know, Black liberation and Indigenous sovereignty. Um, before we get into the conversation, I just want to share with the audience that, you know, I was super privileged and super lucky um, to be asked by Kyle to read his book prior to it being published. And when he asked me, my response was for real because <laughs> I, you know, I just felt really um, honored that, you know, he would ask me and um, I want to read to you all just my excerpt of, you know, sending him my my review of the book, which I will say was longer than <laughs> he asked. And even this this portion is longer than what I was supposed to send in. But it was just every time I read something, I was just like, yet my mind was being blown and I wanted to like share with everybody, you know, what I was learning and what I was um, like my kind of live stream reaction to the book, because I feel like 
so many of my thoughts, you know, he was like addressing, you were addressing in this book. So I'm going to read my whole excerpt. You can find part of it on the back of the book, <laughs> but the whole excerpt, um, I'm just going to read it to you. Okay. So quote, Dr. Mays, who I call him Kyle, but you know, I was trying to be professional. Dr. Mays brilliantly makes accessible the knowledge of how native, black, and Afro-Indigenous communities under the oppressive projects of settler colonialism and white supremacy have navigated points of tension and harm while simultaneously revealing instances where we've resisted by way of solidarity and allyship. In addition, this good word encourages all of us to be continuously aware and critical of the ways in which we perpetuate indigenous erasure and anti-Blackness as we struggle towards Black liberation and indigenous sovereignty respectfully and in parallel. Ultimately, he reminds us that the quote Indian problem and the quote Negro problem are in fact a white supremacist problem. And that was my synopsis as best as I could in like the short amount of like, you know, the space that I was given. Um, because I, I often think that, you know, Black folks and Native folks are taught to see one another as the oppressor, right? Mm -hmm. And instead, we should be um, interrogating that, na that narrative. Um, we should be thinking of how we have been purposely pitted to, against one another, right? And so instead, my hope, and I think that even Kyle's hope, is to reframe the narrative, right? And talk about the, histo the historic historic and both contemporary issues that tend to have us see one another um, as the oppressor, right? Instead of understanding this to be a hierarchy, which is meant to destroy or commodify us, right? So, um, you know, I'm really interested in, you know, Kyle, like what were you hoping that people took away from this book? Meaning, you know, in writing this, like, you know, I know what I took away from it, but what, what was your hope? Yeah, I think for me, the biggest thing that I continue to come to is, can we interrogate U.S. democracy, right? Mm -hmm. U.S. liberal democracy. So if something like U.S. liberal democracy is based foundationally, that is literally its foundation that undergirds it is based on the exploitation uh, and enslavement of people of African descent and the dispossession and ongoing colonization and occupation of indigenous land. And that's foundational to U.S. democracy. What does that tell us as to why we continue to hold U.S. democracy up as kind of this grand thing that we should all aspire to? And also something that the United States government continues to expand around the world through war, which I don't know how you spread democracy uh, through warfare. That that doesn't seem like a good idea, right? Right. Um, and, that, and for me, that's like a found, and it's in the founding documents, whether this is a Declaration of Independence, whether it's the Lexi de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, the Federalist Papers, all these documents are as anti-Black and anti-Indigenous as you can get. And yet still, people hold things like the Constitution as well, as sacrosanct, as something that is so sacred that we should not question them and it's something that we should aspire to, right? And I'm saying, no, can we please think uh, criti more critically about that? Yeah, and in addition to that, you know, thinking critically about it and then thinking about what we want that's, you know, that is more right. inclusive of, you know, those who don't fit, you know, who the constitution was made for, right? Who democracy was really, really supposedly made for. Um, I love that. And I, the other thing I, I wanna say that I love about your book is um, how accessible it is. Um, I remember I was pretty much live streaming you <laughs> early on while I was reading it. And one of the things that I said to you was, um, I love how much Ebonics is in this book. And if you don't know what oh, Ebonics yeah. is, it's African American vernacular English or AAVE, what we call it now. But you know, us, us folks in the hood, we called it Ebonics, right? And so I really appreciated how, you know, there was academics, you know, there's a lot of academics in it, but it's not to the point where it um, disenfranchises 
the knowledge, you know, people from the knowledge that you're presenting. And so uh, I think in the work that we do when we're envisioning a different future, when we're critiquing democracy, when we're deciding if this nation is something that we really want to uphold, um, we have to make sure that the work that we do, like you said, improves the material and social conditions of Black and Native folks and other people oppressed within these systems, right? And so I feel like you know, that was one thing that I really appreciated about this book is that I felt like I could give it to like a teenager and they could read it and be like, dang, I didn't know and not feel like um, you were speaking to an audience of folks who who don't even experience these, you know, these conditions. Right. And so um, I just want to say that that is so very important to me when I'm, you know, trying to seek out information. I mean, I love academics, but I really want to make sure that as we start to think about or continue the work that we that has been done, right? Because I, I believe that our ancestors and even us as contemporaries, like our goal is to um, be the architects and the authors of our liberation. So as we go forward, it's really important that we make sure that knowledge is accessible. And I, I'm interested in, you know, what your what was that your goal too? Was it to make sure that everybody could read this book and not just, you know, maybe your contemporaries in the academy. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so there's kind of two reasons in writing this way. One, I wanted my family to read it, uh, who are non-specialists, non-academics. They're Afro-Indigenous, but often us academics can be very, uh, obtuse in our writing in a certain way even i just use the word like obtuse in our writing <laughs> uh but so it's influenced by family so um as a brief bio into explaining that a bit more my great grandma grandmother esther shabus mays came to the city of detroit uh as a when in 1940 a second on chippewa woman and then married my great grandfather who is African-American and they had these Afro-Indigenous children. They grew up in Detroit. They grew up around a very black culture and my Aunt Judy founded the third ever public school with an indigenous curriculum in the city of Detroit uh, in the early nineties. And I say all that to say is they grew up in a very black context. Like they're Afro-Indigenous, but they grew up in, a, in, a, in the sense of they knew who they were but they spoke Ebonics because they grew up around people speaking a certain language. Doesn't matter where you, if, if you grow up around a certain place, that's the kind of language you speak. So I wanted to make sure I honored that. But also uh, my academic mama mentor, Dr. Geneva Smitherman, uh, who has a fantastic memoir about uh, her struggles in the language wars, as she calls it, is a key figure in understanding and developing literature on African American language. So, uh, one of her key uh, books of many is called "Talking and Testifying the Language of Black America," which was published in 1977. And she writes and talks the same way she does. And for me, it was always important to disrupt uh, how we write history to make sure it's accessible. To also disrupt how for narrating and writing history because an important uh, reason and activity in challenging white supremacy and colonialism is the discourse and language that we use. Absolutely. I mean, that's essential. So that, that that's kind of why, you know, trying to do some of those things. Yeah, I mean, I think that being ourselves is the best way we can refuse these systems, right? Honoring, mm -hmm. you know, the ways we talk to each other and speak to one another, um, you know, loving our hair, loving our, you know, the ways in which we see the world, like celebrating those things, because I think that that is the best way, um, like you said, to disrupt systems that would have us think that proximity to our oppressors makes us more human, like validates our humanity. Um, right. And I think oftentimes, you know, we we are ashamed of not fitting into some ideal, even those ideas that were created for specifically for mm -hmm. you know our racialized groups, right? And I think that sometimes we end up playing Indian or playing black to fit into some ideas about um, so that, that that our oppressor feels comfortable, we make them comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, yeah, it's it's just your book did a, did a really good job of 
refusing like all of those ideas that we need to perform our identities for to for folks to feel um valid for us to feel validated right that's um, right the other thing I really wanted to um, speak to you about, and you you mentioned it a little bit um, in talking about like historical uh, kind of comparing our his histories as like Black and Native folks, um, but we you know you and I regularly talk about solidarity, and it's something that I feel like I've been having a conversation online about a lot, and I find that there are people in kind of two groups: either solidarity is dead, it's not a thing, why are we even pretending it's a thing, and then there are, there are those who are like, no, but we we need solidarity. We need to like continue to work at it. And I even had some friends, um, uh, Carrie and um, uh, my, my mind's blanking on <laughs> the other <laughs> folks, but we were talking about how solidarity, um, if it stays as sol like the act of solidarity and it doesn't move towards like, you know, we're, 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 we're doing something together that isn't just like, I'm going to show up for you, right? Like, I'm actually going to be there by your side, and I'm going to continue to do this work. That solidarity just becomes a performance, right? It becomes a commodity that we use yeah. to, say, to gain social currency. So I think that building solidarity, um, using kind of this these historic and present day realities that are unique to our individual communities, like, and require us to understand what both of our groups have been through and also understanding that there could be two different goals, right? Because I think that you talk about, like one is about, you know, land back, you know, one's about getting land from like our oppressor, right? And how do, how then does that, how does that create conflict among, amongst our group? And can there then be real solidarity if there are two different goals? Um, do you think there's a way for us to, work to have the same goal? Do you think there's a way for us to actually have land back and also um, hold the settler state accountable for what it's done to Black folks? Yeah, I so think- relations is what I'm pretty much saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's essential that we do these things simultaneously. Um, but one thing people have to do is learn each other's history and really interrogate what you know about people, what you, what you think you know about people, what you think you know about their history. And, you know, I'm glad you said that um, being in solidarity can be a, uh, a commodity because you get some social currency out of it. It's beautifully stated. Um, I'm about to take that by the way. Uh, I, I, I love that saying. Um, but, but for me, Solidarity, as you're saying, cannot simply be always you showing up. And although that's important sometimes, but you have to develop kinship. Yes. Yes. And you develop the kinship through struggle, right? Like initially, like any sort of relationship, it takes work, it takes effort, it takes communication, it takes forgiveness, it takes giving people space, it takes all sorts of things, right? For yeah. any sort of relationship to work and a clear understanding of what people want out of it. Yeah. Right? And understanding, understanding, you know, your own traumas, your own past, and how you want to build that sort of future together going forward. And if people don't really try to do that, then you're, you're just going to be in solidarity. And then when something hits the fan, then you're just going to like disappear from one another, which is not helpful at all. And, and, I wish people would give people grace too. For real. We we grew up in a settler colonial society. Uh, we grew up in an anti-black society, yep. a society that hates and erases indigenous peoples. And if that's the case, many people don't know what they don't know. And it can be jarring for you, you know, as a recipient of something when someone says something or does something that's anti-indigenous or anti-black. But if you can kind of determine that it wasn't malicious, some people are malicious. So, you know, yeah. handle that the way you need to handle that. But if, if they're really trying to understand or come from a, this is why kinship is important. So if you have a question that is maybe ignorant or something, you know, holler at them, 
pulling their coattail a little bit, but hey, I have this question. Maybe it's off base, and they will tell you, yes, that's off base. I wouldn't say that if I were you, but it helps to build when you have those relationships, um, and it helps a uh, collective action against oppression. Mm. So without kinship, we're never going to really get there. For real. And I think that part you brought up about understanding one another's politics is really huge. I think that sometimes we think we're in solidarity with someone, but we don't know them enough to know that their politics. And I think all of us, even those of us who are friends may have politics that differ, but our core beliefs are rooted in, like you said, the idea of community and kinship. And I think, you know, a question that I often get is, you know, when it when it comes to like reparations and, you know, giving black folks land, you know, I really try to frame this in a different way, because I think sometimes we often think we need our oppressor as our mediator, right, to figure out how we have a black and, you know, indigenous future outside of them. And I really want to, you know, I really want to push back against that. So I, I usually frame it as. African-Americans are the descendants of indigenous peoples of Africa. And I think that sometimes right. we don't lend indigeneity to black folks. You know, there are black folks globally who are indigenous, right? And when I say indigenous, think of that as a global term and not, you know, not native. Like when we talk about native, we're, you know, we're centering that in people here on Turtle Island, right? But I'm talking about indigeneity as a global term. And mm -hmm. I think that sometimes we forget that black folks around the world in Africa, even folks in Australia, our relatives in, in our uh, Australia are racialized as black, right? Yeah. But so, so if we're saying that Black folks are the indigenous and uh, are the descendant of indigenous people. They too have been, we too have been dispossessed, right? We too have been dispossessed of like our cultures and our lands um, and our inherent right to, um, to be on the lands of our ancestors. So for me, if we talk about the land too, also as our kin, do we not understand that the, the land here on Turtle Island recognizes the indigeneity of Black folks who have been dispossessed? And so then we need to reframe this. So then how do we as kin all live together on the land that is also our kin? And that doesn't mean that I don't think that we should um, honor Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island's right to the inherent right to um, the lands of their ancestors, our ancestors here. But I really think that we need to broaden like our view of like who is indigenous and who is not. And again, this is not Hotep stuff. This is not me <laughs> saying that I believe that Black folks are the original peoples of the Americas. Because you know, you and I have had to have that conversation about how uh -huh. lots of folks will just lump Afro-Indigenous folks, Black Native folks into that group of like, we are trying to erase um, indigenous peoples of, you know, of the Americas. But I really do want to kind of push back on the idea that we need to follow this script of we need the settler state to determine how Black and Native folks have relationship to one another, when maybe we should use the land as the mediator. You know, you know that's, that's something that I think about often and try to reframe so that we can start building kinship relationships with one another, really start to determine what our politics are, I and mean, then be open to our politics needing to change and grow, right? And making sure that we're having these kind of constant conversations about kinship and what does kinship mean? And not just repeating it for the sake of, again, social currency, but as a way to envision that future that we want. Um, yeah, yeah. Did you have something you want to add to that? No. Or, yeah. I mean, I did, but that, that, no, I just have a lot of thoughts. We have a little time, so. Yeah. Um, well, if there's something you want to add before, I think there's a couple of questions and I think we have about 15 minutes. So if there's anything you want to add before I, you know, read a couple of these questions, um, go for yeah, it. Yeah, I'll be brief, but I think it would be beautiful for Native nations, uh, recognized and unrecognized. I think it's important to say that. Yeah, for sure. Um, one way to reject the the issue of recognition from the settler state that is the United States, what are the protocols for adopting and incorporating um, guests, newcomers, yes. outsiders onto the land? Now, if they had those historically and they've kept those up and continue those practices, do so. Yes. Uh, if you don't, you know, those may have been lost for a variety of reasons create new protocols. Yes. Uh, that would be a direct rejection of uh, US colonialism and rejecting the power of the state and letting the land, as you said, mediate 
by incorporating people on your territory uh, as much as you can under uh, occupation and finding ways to still be able to connect and inviting people. So um, if there are ceremonies that are that you can allow, you know, people not from that particular nation to participate, uh, invite. Right. Do those things together, create new traditions, new forms of ceremony for uh, for black and native peoples and other and other uh, groups as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely want us to remember, you know, that we as black and native folks are dynamic people. We are not required to exist in some like historical idea of like who we are. Mm -hmm. Neither, you know, I think even for some of us within our nations feel we're, we're concerned about losing more if we if we allow ourselves to be dynamic. Right. And so I agree with you is that if there aren't protocols that exist or have been lost, it's OK for us to think bigger because that's that's our job. Right. To envision the future that we want and, and to practice the future that we want, because right. as we know, empires fall and this like all empires, this too will come to an end. That's my belief. And so yes. if we're not doing that work right now, if we're not prepare, preparing for what we want, we'll find ourselves replicating the very systems that we say that you know are harming us and killing us. That's and right. I think that we do see that sometimes in some of our nations that it's simply replicating settler state politics and ideas. And that's how we get people dispossessed, disenrolled and all those things, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I'm going to scroll up on the comment section and see um, if we can get a couple of these questions in. So the first question was from Marisol. Marisol, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, I listened to a segment on NPR on how folks are reporting as Native American after getting DNA tests showing they were part Native. How does this contribute to the misrepresentation in funding and policy? Um. Uh, well, don't do the DNA test. <laughs> I mean, you know, I heard there are some times where I've heard families connecting. So although, you know, people having your DNA is a whole nother issue, but it doesn't, DNA doesn't determine your uh, citizenship or I'll say kinship to yes. people. So what is your... Uh, cultural, and I'm not saying people should not reconnect to you, because uh, often that's the other part of what people are saying. Like, you know, if you're reconnecting, you're illegitimate. No, I don't believe in that either. Yeah. No. Uh, but it, if you are reconnecting, like, actually do the work of reconnecting with folks. Um, you know, whether that's through family, uh, whether that's through a tribal nation. You know, I got. You don't know, all of a sudden. Uh, have to be out there leading the charge of indigenous liberation, just <laughs> fall back and chill. Um, but the DNA thing, it does, it does lead to misrepresentation because of that. Yes. Uh, and I won't get into the whole notion of a pretending and all that stuff, but there are, you know, folks who take a DNA test, they find out they're 22.893%. <laughs> Native American or something, and then they cheese or whatever tribal nation. Uh, then they get found out like 10, 15, 20 years later. So yeah. don't do that. But um, that's been an issue for a long time, even outside of DNA, though, of people playing Indian. Yeah, for real. And I do think that, you know, I want to also agree with you in that sometimes those DNA tests are more about finding like your direct relatives, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes like ancestry will tell you who your cousins are. And I think if your cousins have established relationships and tribes, that's different than, yeah, getting that 29 point whatever percent and then being like, I'm Cherokee, which is what most people do, right? And you start being an identity that don't belong, you don't belong to. Um, and I think that understanding the difference between like being of descent and being like actually a part of community is also a really important conversation that I think that we should be having. Um, and I think um, we have to really interrogate how these companies commodify identities um, and then mm -hmm. sell them to folks so that people can then feel like they belong. Um, when that's not their right, they have no authority to tell people like you are Cherokee if you 
when they don't ha even have the ability to be able to do so, right? So we just have to remember that these things are also um, commodities, right? They're they're being sold to people. Identity is being sold to people, and you know that's that can be really problematic. Um, so Telly Tellis um, says here on um, as well as the five civilized tribes, can he touch on the buffalo soldiers? Um. Do you want to mention anything about the about the five tribe? You know, it's just your people sure. over there. <laughs> uh, you know, so I think I think when we're talking about the five tribes, like you said, I think that come becomes the central narrative of like you know native folks enslaved um, black folks, and I think that that's a really problematic statement because not all native fo folks um, contributed or participated in chattel slavery. But if you think about what the where the five tribes were, so the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, Chickasaw, the Seminole, the Cherokee, and you know my tribe, the Muscogee Creek, um, we were in the South, right? We were in those plantation states, and so you know, as white folks and Native folks and Black folks were all coming together in this place where Black folks were were considered chattel, um, for Native folks we had this kind of, we were put in this position, like, you know, do we participate in this um, system or do we reject it and, you know, go our own way? But, you know, we both, our tribes, our tribes, members of our tribes decided that, you know, they were going to participate um, as a means, I think, of protecting um, or wanting to make sure that what was being dispossessed, you know, I have so many thoughts. I'm trying to like find a way to make this concise. But long story short, our tribes participated in this horrible system, this horrible project. Um, and now there are repercussions, right? Now folks, freedmen, our freedmen descendants, who have also been dispossessed of cultural identity as being part of our nations, yeah. um, and many of them also sharing not just kinship, but blood, you know, with us are seen as not a part of our tribes. And this for me is rooted in anti-blackness, right? This is rooted in the idea that black folks um, aren't, aren't, can't be native as well, right? We we have these discussions um, in I think the Afro-Indigenous community about the ways in which, you know, black natives aren't seen as authentic, right? And so I, that conversation is a really hard conversation because it, it really holds us to, do we actually believe in kinship? And do we actually want to disrupt and refuse the system that we say is like causing, you know, Native folks harm? Um, so I think that that's kind of briefly what I want to say. I, if we had more time, I think we could go into like the five tribes, but um, I don't want to speak to any of the nations, including my own. But I do want us to be realistic about the fact that our tribes participated in chattel slavery. And when we were forced to walk the Trail of Tears, many of our tribes um our enslaved ancestors walked the tr the trail with them, right? They mm -hmm. they knew the language. They spoke, you know. They they knew the culture. They um, were in the house of kings, like in my tribe. And so this wasn't just folks who were, you know, not a part of community. Our you know our freedmen relatives were our kin and still are, and we should be honoring that. So I don't know if you want to mention a little bit about the Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um. So. The Buffalo Soldiers of the 8th and 9th Cavalry, uh, and they were formed as a part of the Army uh, sort of Reorganization Act of 1866. Uh, and the U.S. government de decided, well, and many of them were veterans of the Civil War fighting for their own freedom. And so remember, during the Civil War, while Black people are fighting for their own freedom, the United States is waging various forms of genocide against tribal nations on the plains and out west. So this is how crazy empire colonization works. Uh, this sort of tension between black freedom and native subjugation at that particular historical time period. Yeah. And so the Buffalo soldiers were used and sent out uh, and in general uh, participated in acts of genocide against various tribal nations in the southwest uh, on the plains, and some acted to protect certain tribal nations, but not, not you know, there's a few exceptions there. Uh, and it went on for a long time. And then those same Buffalo soldiers participated in the U.S. military in wars of, 
aggression as the U.S. began to expand um, uh, as a global empire around the world. So it is uh, a complicated history, but something I think we still need to talk about and come to terms with. Yeah, and I remember um, um, being um, speaking with Brian Klopotic about this, and he said, you have to remember that for a lot of Native tribes, like on the plains and out west, the Buffalo sur- soldiers were their first encounter with the settler state. And so for them, there wasn't like this racialized idea, and they didn't have a full context of like, who the Buffalo soldiers were and that they too were fighting for their freedom. And like this job as a soldier was one of the only jobs that they could get, right? This, there was no context other than here are these soldiers who are displacing us, committing acts of genocide, causing us harm, right? And so again, I think that that's what we're, this conversation is, is about is that, you know, we have to kind of step back and look at it, you know, from a broader context of like empire, right? And we have to understand the ways in which the settler state um, and our oppressors tend to use us against one another, and then we point the finger at one another. Um, this doesn't mean that we don't dis- that we. This doesn't mean that we dismiss the harm that we cause one another, because there has been real lateral violence. And again, that could be just as a means of um, survival, but it also could just be because some people are just horrible people, right? And we don't have to pretend or romanticize any of this stuff. I think it's you know, as Kyle said, we are you know, building relationship, building kinship, building community. And all that means that, that means that all of this stuff has to come out. We have to talk about it all, but we, if we don't contextualize it, if we don't understand the roots of how we got here, then we're still going to be pointing our fingers at one another instead of pointing up, you know, pointing where the, at the hierarchy, understanding that this is all, this is very intentional. And this is how empire is maintained, is that oppressed people see one another as, you know, the other and also the, the, in the instrument of harm. And so I'm hoping that you all will read this book, get it, please. I think that you can like submit your email so that you can have an opportunity to win it. But either way, see that that's like urgency, get it. <laughs> get the book because I think it will really um, have you answer some questions or have you ask yourself some questions and even provide some answers that I think that Maybe many of us, you know, didn't even know we needed the answers to. You. So um, I'm really grateful to be in this conversation. Like I said, I'm always grateful to um, be in conversation with you because I feel like I learn a lot and it, it challenges my own politics. And I don't know if we have enough time for another question. Um, let's see. Okay, so I think our host just uh, highlighted this question from Ling Throwaway. Um, how can Afro-Indigenous politics be centered in local politics, LA specifically too? You wanna to take that one on? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think one particular way to do this is around issues. So the issues around uh, unhoused people or homelessness, right? as one particular example, and one of my colleagues in LA, Nanya Roy, is working with a fantastic organization and publishing some of their findings over the last um, year or two around that. And if we consider that a continuation of dispossession of Native peoples and how those things continue well into the present, it's one particular issue to center those particular politics and getting those particular voices uh, more you know, out there, more well-known uh, in order to fight for that particular struggle because it's really an issue of, uh, of land, honestly. Uh, and that's something that white people, indigenous peoples, Latinx folks, uh, white people, poor people can all sort of get around to fight against that particular issue. Yeah, and I think that if, um, that's a really great example, I appreciate that. Um, I also think that it kind of starts with first acknowledging that Afro-Indigenous people exist. I think oftentimes that's not, you know, we haven't even got to that point where we recognize that people can exist as both Black and Native. Um, Mm -hmm. And that is an authentic identity um, that people can then speak to both issues, like issues on both sides of their um, identities, and that that is legitimized. Because I think oftentimes, you know, when Black Native folks show up and, you know, start to try to speak for something, then people often reject them as, reject us as not 
um, being authentic. So I, I really hope that as we start having these conversations that folks don't um, categorize Afro-Indigenous and Black Native folks as others within any of our identities and that um, and and give us place to to speak and believe us when we say, you know, things happen to us or, you know, things are harming us or that we are being um, disenfranchised from our communities. So I just think that that's really important. That's great. So with that, I'll turn it back over to our hosts um, since it is five o'clock. Kevin, thank you so much for letting us have this conversation. Um, it was really powerful. I appreciate it. Yeah, and it seemed like a lot of people were really engaged with the topic and one um, I hope keeps getting explored and dug into and just mm, becomes more current with a lot of people. So thank you so much for having this great discussion. And uh, yeah, hope to have you back soon. When Amber has her book out. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no we'll pressure. Now. Yeah, right. Just no do it. <laughs> Thank you again so much, you two. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us for today's LA May program. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And don't forget to check out our next LA May program on Thursday, March 10th at 4 p.m. for Chef Jetila, uh, which was an earlier rescheduled program from uh, this month. Chef Jet Tila knows a thing or two about Thai cuisine. Growing up in Los Angeles, he spent time learning the ancient traditions of Asian cuisine from his Cantonese grandmother and working in the famed Bangkok market. Now as a restaurant owner and judge on the store Cutthroat Kitchen, he'll bring his years of experience and hard earned knowledge for this amazing program. Step inside Jet's kitchen and learn the secrets to making your favorite Thai dishes taste better than takeout. Participants will have an opportunity to win a free copy of Jet's books. So until next time, we really do appreciate all your support. The success of LA Made and all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you so much and have a great day.